if we're starting five minutes late, I can finish 20 minutes late, right? This is the, yeah, excellent. Great, okay, so I'm taking, uh, taking out of your coffee break. No, no. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, approximate kernelization or lossy kernels, uh, what you already saw some of in the open problem session. Um, so uh, this follows the, the paper of myself and Sawcat and Fahad and MS Ramanujan, who's not here today. Um, and the paper, the definition is not quite what I'm putting up on the board, but uh, for all purposes, this is really what you need to know. Uh, so, so in order to work with this, uh, this is what you need to know for what lossy kernels are. So the idea is uh, we, add, we think about kernelization as you apply preprocessing to your problem first, you make your instance smaller, then you're going to do something to it. Uh, usually in parameterized complexity, you actually solve it, right? You, you say yes or no, you have a solution that's this good, or you don't have a solution that's that good. Uh, but what if you want to run an approximation algorithm or a heuristic on your reduced instance? Uh, then you need to have some way to use an imperfect answer to the reduced instance. So, so you better... Uh, be able to do something with solutions that are not necessarily optimal or an answer like this is a yes instance, this is a no instance, but instead if someone gives you a 1.5 approximate solution to the reduced instance, hopefully you're able to at least produce a 1.5 approximate, uh, approximate solution to the original instance. But now if you're settling for losing something uh, when you're solving the reduced instance, maybe you can also settle and lose something on the way back up, right? So if someone gives you a 1.5 approximate solution to the reduced instance, maybe you're okay with returning a 1.6 approximate solution to the original. Uh, and what do you hope to win from this? Well, uh, by sacrificing a little bit on the quality of the solution, one could hope to win a lot on how small uh, this pre-processed <coughs> pre instance is. Because perhaps you just sacrifice a little bit on what happens when you translate solutions from the bottom and back up to the top, uh, or from the right and back to the left, but at the same time you're able to make your pre-processed instance so small that your heuristics actually return very good solutions to the reduced instance. So, so without further ado, this is the definition. Uh, you consider some parameterized problem where k is the parameter. Uh, k can either be the value of opt or something else. Most of the time today, k is not going to be the value of the solution you're looking at. Um, and uh, what you want to do is in polynomial time, you want to either uh, conclude that uh, there is no solution of size at most k if you're dealing with a, mini with a minimization problem and uh, k is the value of the optimum, uh, or that here is a solution of value at least k if you're dealing with a maximization problem and k is the parameter. Uh, if not, then this green arrow is irrelevant. Then you should output a preprocessed instance uh, so that any C approximate solution to the reduced instance can be lifted back up in polynomial time to a C times alpha approximate solution to the original. And now of course, uh, and, and this is when, what you call an alpha approximate kernelization. So let's insert alpha equals two. So what's a two approximate kernelization? I kernelize my instance so that optimal solutions to the reduced thing uh, I can lift them back up to two approximate solution to the original. Two approximate solution to the reduced thing gets lifted back up to four approximate solution to the original, and so on. So in particular, if you're already able to produce a two approximate solution to the original, then you can discard the, you can discard the preprocessed instance altogether. And your two approximate solution is already a two approximate kernel. So uh, now, so, so, so in particular, what does this mean, right? It means that uh, if I have a 
polynomial time alpha approximation, right? Uh, then I actually have an alpha approximate kernel of constant size, right? All you need, you, you don't even need a solution to the reduced instance. Uh, you can just give back this, the approximate solution to the original thing. Now, um, at the same time, of course, if I have an alpha approximate kernel, so if I have a two approximate kernel for my problem, then I also have an FBT time alpha approximation for the same parameterization. Because just as for normal parameterized problems, I can first kernelize and then uh, I can run a brute force on the kernel and then return things back up. Right? Um, so the first two are actually formal mathematical proofs. Uh, this one here is intuition that holds for all kernels that we know, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to hold. And this is that if you already have a polynomial kernel for your problem, or if you have a kernel of size blah for your problem, then that is a one approximate kernel for the same problem. In particular, Every time you make a proof of correctness for your kernel, what you're doing is a solution of size at most blah to the reduced instance is actually a solution of size at most blah to the original one. Or at least there is some polynomial time procedure to lift that thing back up. And usually it doesn't depend on your solution being optimal. It just depends on it being locally minimal in some way. So, so, so just about any argument that you've ever done uh, for the reverse direction of a yes is less than, is less is equal less if yes if and only if yes for a normal kernel actually with small modifications uh, tell you that your kernel is actually one approximate. Okay, so so to, to so right now we actually don't know any examples uh, of problems where there is a kernel of some size and at the cost of making it just a tiny bit bigger, typically a constant factor, uh, we cannot make it. Uh, we, ca we cannot make it one approximate. So what does this mean? This means that if you have decided uh, that I want to work on some problem, and I want to get a 100 approximate kernel of size k to the 50 for your problem, then there are some sanity checks you have to do first. What are those sanity checks? So the first is that you should check that the problem is FBT or has a factor 100 approximation in f of k and to the c time, so in FBT time. Because a consequence of your kernel would be an FBT approximation, and it's typically easier to get to design an FBT approximation than it is to design a kernel. Just like it's easier to design an FBT algorithm than it is to make a kernel for the problem. Of course, sometimes you make the FBT algorithm by making the kernel, but in a formal sense, uh, it's easier to make the FBT algorithm first. Okay? Uh, now, the second thing is you should check that no normal k to the power 50 kernel is known. Right? Uh, if a k to the power 50 kernel is known, you can probably stare at that kernel and conclude that it's already one approximate. There's no need in making a 100 approximate kernel of size k to the 50. You should make one of size k to the 49. Okay? Um, and finally, uh, you should check that no 100 approximation algorithm in polynomial time is known. Again, if a 100 approximation is known, well, then you can aim for a 99 approximate kernel. Right? So you should aim for something that is doing better than the best uh, approximation algorithm. So the, the ratio should be better than the ratio of the best approximation algorithm in polynomial time. And the kernel size should be better than the best kernel that you can do in polynomial time. But at the same time, the approximation ratio should be not better than the best approximation algorithm you can do in, FB, in FBT time. Okay? So that's the, th th that is where the game for approximate kernels is. So any questions to this? Okay. So um, let's look at an example. Uh, partial vertex cover. So... I give you a graph G and an integer k 
and I ask you, uh, find a set of vertices of size at most k that covers as many edges as possible. So uh, it's partial vertex covered because you don't need to cover all of the edges. You're trying to cover as many edges as you can. If you co can cover m equals to the number of edges in g edges, of course, then your solution is a vertex cover. That's the best case. So here is an example if I give you this graph and I say that k is equal to 2, then if I pick the two, the two red vertices, then I cover all of the edges that are highlighted in purple. Right? Um, so notice that this middle edge between the two red vertices is covered one, is covered twice, once from both sides, uh, but we only count it once. Right? So this is the reason you can't just pick the vertices of highest degree, because they can have a lot of edges between each other, and therefore you might end up double counting. So that's really the only reason why this problem is NP-complete. Okay, so what is known about this problem? Um, what's known is that it does have a 1 plus epsilon approximation algorithm in f of k poly n time. It is W1 hard, so there is no FPT algorithm to actually solve it. So, it so, so for normal kernels, it has no kernel of size f of k for any function f. Okay? It does have a constant factor approximation, an incredibly good one, uh, 0 0.92. So uh, that's uh, just about as good as approximation algorithms get without being p tassels. But it's known not to have a factor C approximation for some constant C, so perhaps 0 0.99 is what you can't do, right? Um, is that modulo ETH? Or no, this is modulo P not equal to NP, and perhaps modulo unit games, I didn't find it, it close to 0 0.92 is actually tight, but I'm not certain, okay? So I, I, I wouldn't make that claim, okay? Um, so now the question is, uh, if you've been awake, what kind of approximation ratio and size uh, of a lossy kernel should we, be, should we be aiming for? Well, that depends on whether you are a pessimist or an optimist. So if you're a pessimist, uh, you should be aiming for the like, least progress that's still progress. Right? So then you should be aiming for a 0 0.93 approximate kernel, um, and you have an FPT, fact, FPT approximation, so there is an exponential kernel that's 1 plus epsilon approximate, so you better aim for a polynomial kernel. So if you, can, you can aim for a 0 0.93 approximate po kernel of poly k size, okay, that, that is already progress. Now if you're an optimist, then, of course, you aim for a 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel of polynomial size, or perhaps even of linear size. Right? And now, again, depending on whether you're a pessimist or an optimist, um, polynomial for every fixed value of epsilon uh, can take different forms. Uh, it can take the form uh, k to the power 1 over epsilon, uh, where so, so uh, epsilon is in the exponent, uh, it can be like 2 to the 1 over epsilon k squared, uh, or it can be k squared over epsilon squared. So these, these sort of shapes of running times precisely measure, uh, precisely mimic what we're used to for p tasses and ep tasses and parameterized algorithms and whatnot. So, of course, k to the 1 over epsilon is the worst of these, and k squared over epsilon squared is, is the best, right? Because if you. Uh, if you see how this size grows with k and epsilon, on the left it grows faster than on the right, but on the other hand, for every fixed value of epsilon, all of these are still polynomial in k. Right? So you can get a polynomial in uh, k kernel uh, for every value of epsilon, 0 0.00001, if you would like. Right? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that for this case, the optimists win. Um, I, I didn't actually write in the size, so the size is going to be not k squared over epsilon squared, the size is going to be k to the 5. 
over epsilon squared. So, so, so shape-wise, the function is really the best you can hope for. So for every fixed epsilon, there is a k to the 5 kernel for partial vertex cover uh, that is 1 plus epsilon approximate. Uh, and furthermore, the dependence on epsilon is like 1 over poly epsilon. So if you have any questions about what it is we're about to do, right, then, then this is a good time to ask questions. All right. So uh, here's the kernel. You pick the k vertices of highest degree. So you just sort the vertices by their degree, and then you pick them up. And then you ask yourself, well, how many edges did you cover? Well, if you covered a lot of edges, uh, in particular, at least k over 2, k choose 2, uh, divided by epsilon edges. Uh, so notice that when you divide by epsilon, when epsilon is a small number, you're actually multiplying by a giant number, right? Like if, epsilon, if you're trying to get the 1.001 approximation, then dividing by epsilon is actually multiplying by 1,000, right? So, so this is something that's good to keep in mind. Dividing by epsilon actually means multiplying by a lot, right? Uh, so, um, so if you cover poly k times a large constant number of edges, then I claim that this is already an approximate solution, just output that, like a 1 plus epsilon approximate solution. Why is that? Well, uh, when I pick k vertices to cover some edges, if I don't count the double counting, the fact that an edge can be covered from two sides, how much do you cover? Well, the sum of the degrees of the vertices. That's precisely how many edges you cover. But then you double count. What's the maximum number of edges you can double count? Well, the edges between the k vertices you picked. So that's k choose 2. Right? So now, if the sum of the degrees is way bigger than k choose 2, then the fact that you double counted these k choose 2 edges doesn't matter much. Right? And OK, so you can, you can turn this into actual math, but I believe that you can do that yourself. Um, now, the second case is that the k vertices of maximum degree uh, cover no more than k choose 2 over epsilon edges. And then, of course, the maximum degree, the degree of the first vertex, is at most k square over epsilon. That's easy enough, because the first vertex covers at most as many vertices. OK. Uh, and now, uh, we're actually just going to make a normal kernel, not an approximate kernel. Yeah? In the first case, what do you output? What is the there is no kernel. I mean, so imagine when you're doing normal kernelization, right? Uh, and it's, let's say, for a maximization problem. Let's say partial, partial vertex cover parameterized by something. And you ask, well, are there k vertices that cover at least t edges? And you find k vertices that cover at least t edges. Then you say, oh, here's a solution, so I'm done, right? And now formally, you can turn this into like a constant size trivial instance, blah de blah right? You can do the same thing here, but then I would have to spend a lot of time explaining the definitions to you, and I don't want to do that. OK? All right. Um, so now we are in this case where the k vertices of maximum degree cover few edges, and therefore the max degree is actually bounded. OK, so now here's a simple lemma, and that is that there always exists an optimal solution uh, that picks its solution vertices amongst the k times delta vertices of highest degree. Okay, so let me prove this to you. All right, uh, let's pick out the k times delta vertices of maximum degree and let's highlight in red some optimal solution. Okay, and now one out of two things happens. Already, like either already the optimum solution is inside the k times delta vertices of highest degree, or it isn't. If it is, you're done, right? You've proved your claim. If it's not, then here is some vertex that is, uh, that, there is some vertex that is in your optimum solution, but not one of the, your selected high degree vertices. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to remove it from your optimal solution and replace it by one of the vertices <laughs> Uh, by one of the vertices that does have high degree. Now notice that when you do this replacement, 
this vertex has degree less than or equal to the degree of that vertex, right? So you're covering more edges, except you suddenly might double count something that you'd used to not be double counting. So let's ensure that no double counting happens. So when does no double counting happens is if that new purple vertex that I insert is not a neighbor of any vertices in my solution currently, right? Any of the other vertices in the solution. But well, I have k vertices in my solution. Each one of them has at most delta neighbors, right? So if you just black out all of the neighbors of your optimal solution so far in this set, there will be some guy who you didn't black out because you just have enough vertices up there. And then you do that replacement, there is no double counting, you're doing better than you used to do before. Done, right? So there is an optimal solution among the k times delta first vertices in your degree sequence from high to low. Great, now what's the kernel? You delete all of the vertices that are not in the neighborhood of these, of these guys, right? Because if you know that the optimum solution is going to come from here, then all, of you, all you care about are the edges that are inside this set and in its neighborhood, because you, you can cover those edges. And notice that deleting vertices here cannot decrease the value of the optimum. Every vertex is an opportunity to cover some edges. Removing vertices takes away the opportunity to cover those edges, right? Um, so this is, this is quite clearly a kernel. You just reduce the solution, you reduce your search space in your search for the optimum solution, but you know that when you reduce your search space, you kept at least one optimal solution, right? So, so that's actually just a normal kernel. And any solution in this reduced graph is a solution in the original. So uh, an approximate solution to the reduced thing is an approximate solution with the same factor to the original one. Okay, uh, so that's your kernel. And what's the size? Well, uh, it's the, the size is the size of this neighborhood of this marked set. This marked set has size delta times k, and his neighborhood has size delta times k times delta. Right, so it's delta square k, now you insert k square over epsilon for delta and you get k to the 5 times epsilon square and we're done. Here is our 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel for partial vertex cover. So notice we got a 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel of polynomial size for a problem that's actually w hard. Right? So, so you made really as much progress as you possibly could. Well, you actually could do a little bit more progress. Um, it's recently been improved uh, to a kernel of size k over epsilon. So the squared, the, the five and the two disappeared, uh, but then you need to introduce weights. Uh, but you can still do linear in k, in k over epsilon squared, uh, if, if you are happy, to, if, if you don't want to do weights. And this is a, a new result by uh, Manurangsi and Sosa 2019. And here is a really nice kicker to it. The fact that he was able to approve this 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel, he directly plugged it into some black box results. Poof, that is where the 0 0.92 approximation algorithm came from. So prior to Manurangsi making this kernel, the best approximation algorithm for this problem was 0 0.75, right? Then suddenly you get this 1 plus epsilon kernel of linear size, you can apply some black box SDP result and it suddenly runs fast enough to be polynomial time, poof, you get a 0 0.92 approxima approximation algorithm. So it's, it's a nice symbiosis at this point between, um, be between uh, approximate kernelization and back again to the world of approximation algorithms and very much hopefully back to the world of kernelization. Okay, so that was the first problem. Uh, now let's look at another one. Uh, namely, uh, let's look at max cut uh, parameterized by the number of vertices. So, uh, let, so what is this problem? I give you a graph G uh, and then I ask you, can you find some subset of the vertices that maximizes the number of edges with one endpoint in the set and the other endpoint not in the set. This is what I call delta S, where delta is my subset of vertices. Okay? 
Uh, another way of thinking about it is color my vertices black and white, maximize the number of edges with differently colored, edge, uh, differently colored endpoints. Okay. So what's known? Uh, well, it's known that a random or greedy coloring uh, can always cut at least half the edges. Okay, so opt is always at least m over 2. That immediately gives you a factor 2 approximation. This thing has a super famous 0 0.87 algorithm using semi-definite programming by Gomans and Williamson uh, from 2000 and, uh, 2095. Yeah, that's right, from 1995. Um, and it turns out that if you assume the unique games conjecture, that ridiculous uh, number, it's 0 0.87 something something, uh, is actually tight. You cannot improve it by any epsilon uh, without proving that unique games fails. So um, the, we, we roughly know what the approximation should be, or we precisely know what the approximation should be. Uh, and of course, it is FPT with parameter the number of vertices. Uh, and it has an n square kernel with parameter the number of vertices. Duh. Right. So uh, of course, it's open, and I think. Uh, this was asked by Bart uh, whether max cut does have a kernel of size n to the 1.99, right, if there's no approximation. Okay, so now the question is, what kind of kernel, if you're looking for an approximate kernel, should you be looking for? Well, it depends on whether you're a pessimist or an optimist, right? So if, um, if you're a pessimist, you should be looking for a 0.9 approximate kernel of size n to 1.99, right? And if you're an optimist, you should be looking for a 1.00001 approximate kernel of linear size. Right? And again, optimists win. Uh, here is a simple kernel that is 1 plus epsilon approximate, uh, and it has size n over epsilon squared. OK? Um, it's a randomized kernel, and I actually I don't know whether there is a de-randomization for this. Like, if, if Socket, no, Socket is not in the audience. He knows all of these de-randomization tricks. So, uh, all right, maybe we should talk to him offline and ask. All right, um, so here uh, is what we're going to do to achieve this 1.0001 approximate kernel with a linear number of edges. So what we're going to do is we're going to take as input the graph G, and we're going to pick a subgraph of it, G prime, and that subgraph is going to be a random subgraph. In particular, what we're going to do is for every edge, we're going to keep it or remove it with some, small, with some probability. Just going to decide the same probability P. For every edge, you either keep it or remove it. And we're going to say that we succeed with very high probability, almost one, and we'll define what succeed means, but if we succeed, then we have the following two properties. One is that the number of edges is what we want the number of edges to be, linear in n, right? And secondly, uh, we, we know we, if we succeed, then any constant approximate solution s in the reduced instance uh, is a 1 plus epsilon times the same constant approximate solution to the original. So, yeah? So, is it the size, the size is an expectation or you stop once you reach that size? Ah, great. So, uh, we, so, so, how does, so, so how does the algorithm work, right? We're going to pick P so that the number of edges times P is more or less what we want, right? It's 100 times n over epsilon squared, right? Now, uh, you subsample. You, for, for every, for every uh, edge, you throw a coin comes up heads with probability p. If it comes up heads, you keep the edge. OK, now you do that for all the edges. Of course, in expectation, the number of edges you're going to see is 100 of n over epsilon squared. But you could see a lot of more edges, right? But if you see a lot of more edges, you know that you saw a lot more edges. So then you're like, ah, that's a fail, I repeat, right? So you can repeat until you succeed. But you can only repeat until you succeed in terms of the number of edges, because this second property, right, is there a C approximate solution uh, that is not a C approximate solution over there, depends you, like, demands that you check two to the n different things, and you don't know that. So, so you succeed with good probability, but you don't know whether you succeeded or not, right? 
But in terms of the, no of the size of the kernels, you know whether you succeeded or not. Okay. So we picked a probability such that m times p is 100 n over epsilon squared. All right. Um, and uh, for every edge, you keep it with probability p, otherwise you delete it. Now I'm going to, so, so this is going to result in this subgraph g prime, and I'm going to say that m prime is the number of edges in g prime, and for any set s of vertices, it's the same set of vertices, delta prime is the cut set in uh, g prime of that same vertex set. So delta is the cut set in g, delta prime is the cut set in g prime. So this is the definition of success. So um, first, the number of edges is what I want the number of edges to be, right? The expected number of edges is m times p. Uh, and now I allow an additive epsilon, well, epsilon m times p factor. <coughs> it's epsilon, epsilon times expectation factor. Now, uh, for every set, of vertices, he is currently of size, uh, he is currently of size delta of s, um, and what is success? The success should be that delta prime of s is equal to delta s times p. I've, I, I should have written that here, right? So it should be that it is what it's expected to be up to an additive error term of epsilon times the number of edges not epsilon times the size of this cut, okay? So that's, that's a subtle little thing. Uh, hopefully you'll see in a little bit on the, on the next picture why I define success in this way. Now, uh, the first thing we need to prove is that if we do succeed, uh, then it does hold that every C approximate solution in G prime uh, is C approximate, or C times 1 minus epsilon approximate in the original instance G. And I say that this only holds if your C approximation is a good C approximation where C is at least 1 half, but uh, for sets that are worse than 1 half approximate, we don't really care about them because in polynomial time we can get half approximate sets anyway. Right? So if someone gives me some set that cuts less than half the edges of G prime, I know that's not the right set. I should pick one that cuts at least half the edges and I can find one, right? So, so that's, that's sufficient for us. Okay, so here's, here is proof by picture uh, that if we succeed, then C approximate solutions for G prime are actually C approximate for G. So um, let's draw this histogram here. Uh, where on the left, uh, I draw how many edges are there in G, well, there is M of them, and then for each of my 2 to the N vertex sets, I draw how many edges do they actually cut, right? And some of them cut more, some of them cut less, let's sort them from cutting more to, to cutting less, right? So, so then you get this sort of histogram over there, and of course that you know that the largest bar uh, is going to be somewhere between m over 2 and m, right? Because you, you know that you cut at least half of them. Now the next question is, well, suppose you succeed and you like over succeed, you succeed perfectly, uh, so in particular that once you, uh, once you subsample, uh, E of like E prime of G becomes equal to M times P and delta prime of, uh, so delta prime of S uh, becomes equal to delta S times P, then of course if I draw the same sort of histogram on the right, but now I just changed the scale, right? I changed the scale from M over half to M to M times P over to an M P, right? then my picture doesn't change. The only thing that changed was the scale. Right? So if I succeeded perfectly, then my picture on the left and right didn't change at all, 
And then, of course, C approximate solutions to the right are C approximate solutions to the left. Optimal solutions on the left are optimal solutions on the right. There, we didn't really change anything. This is precisely the same as you have some weighted problem and you divide all the weights by 10. Nothing happened, right? But now we allow some additive error. And the thing that's happening now is that I divided all of the weights by 10, and then I added or subtracted 0 0.0001 to every weight. Right? And then you can do some inequalities and argue that, well, uh, when, if you have a very small additive error, then you also don't have a giant multiplicative error. Okay, so some inequalities, I don't write those inequalities. I started writing them and I filled the whole, I filled like a whole slide with them. Like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But I think you can believe me that like, well, if you only have a small additive error like this, like the, the blue thing is how much these things can, can woggle around, uh, then the picture on the left sort of looks like the picture on the right, which means that if a set is near optimal on one side, it's also near optimal on the other. And, and the important thing is that this margin of error uh, is a small fraction of the total number of vertices, or sorry, of the total number of edges, right? And because you know that the opt, like we know that the optimum number of edges cut is at least half of all the edges, uh, even though for really bad solution, my margin of errors is multiplicatively really bad, for the ones that are near optimal, it's good. Right? That's, that's sort of the crucial part of, of a formal proof for this. Okay, um, so I'm not going to do this. Uh, what I am going to do is I'm going to say that uh, the I'm going to prove to you that the probability of success is actually almost one. It's even better than what I write. I mean, but uh, let's let's just prove this for now. What is the definition of success? Well, the definition of success is no failure. Uh, and what's a failure? Well, it's either that the number of edges you have in your graph is not what you want the number of edges in the graph to be, uh, or it is that for some set S, its cut set changes in a different way than what you want it to change, right? right? Like the number of edges that you subsampled from that cut set is very far away from its expectation. So uh, what does it mean that the number of edges is failing? Well, it means that the number of edges in G prime minus what you want the number of edges in G prime to be, namely m times p, is at least epsilon m times p. Right? What does it mean that some set S fails? Uh, well, it is that its cut set minus what you want the cut set actually to be is at least epsilon m times p. Right? So in particular, these are now random variables. And really what you're asking about is what is, uh, like, so, so failure is that these random variables deviate from their expectation by at least epsilon m times p. And for the number of edges, of course, m times p is the expected number of edges. So, so now you're asking what is the probability that the number of edges deviates from its expectation by at least an epsilon factor of its expectation, right? And now we know that uh, the number of edges is a sum of independent 0, 1 random variables because we're, sa we're, we're independently sampling every edge. So this is a Bernoulli distribution. What should you do with a Bernoulli distribution? You Chernoff bound it. Okay, so we Chernoff bound it. All right, so we, we throw Chernoff at it. And what do you get? Well. Uh, the probability that you deviate from expectation uh, in at least epsilon times your expectation is e like 1 over e to the epsilon squared times the expectation. Uh, so that's what Chernoff says the right answer is. And what do you get now? You get precisely that this is 1 over e to the epsilon squared. And now you just plug in for m prime, uh, or e of m prime, that, uh, that's m times p. And how did we choose p? We chose p so that m times p was 100 n over epsilon squared. Right? That, that, that's how we chose p in the first place. So now you just plug this in and you get that. Your epsilon squares cancel. So your failure probability for 
is, at, <coughs> is actually at most 0 0.00001 times 1 over 2 to the n. But this is the failure probability that the number of edges is the wrong value, right? Okay, now let's analyze what happens for each subset S. Well, for each subset S, we're asking um, what is the probability that the, when I subsample from this cut, uh, the, sub, the size of the subsample deviates from its expectation at least epsilon m times p, right? So it's like as much as the all edges should deviate from the expectation. And now, so, so now that I'm subsampling from a smaller set, but I want my additive deviation to be the same as before, the probability of failure can only go down, right? Like, if I, so, so think of it like this, if I throw 100 coins and I count the number of heads, uh, I expect it to be 50, right? And now I ask, what's the probability that I deviate from 50 by at least 10? Well, like, do, do I get at least 60 or at most 40? That's going to be some really tiny probability. Now if I instead only throw 20 coins, or let's, let's do 30. I suppose instead I only throw 30 coins, my expectation is still 15. And now I ask, what's the probability that I deviate from that by at least 10? So getting at least 5 or at, le or at most 5 or at least 25. So that deviation with only 30 coins is less likely than when I had 50 coins. Okay? Uh, you, can, you can play around with it and convince you, yourselves that that is actually true. Okay? So, so in particular, the probability that any fixed cut set fails is less than the probability that the number of edges fails, which is in particular less than 0 0.00001 over times 1 over 2 to the n. Right? So you have like 2 to the n possible failures, and each one of them happens with probability 1 over 2 to the n times a small number. So by the union bound, none of the failures happen with probability 0 0.00001. Right? If you have five things, each one of them fails with probability one over 10, uh, then you know that none of them happen, none of the failures happen with probability at least one half, or all, at least one failure happens with probability at most one half. Yeah, so it's like normal probability computations. Okay, so what's the kicker? The kicker is really that if I just pick a linear size random sample of my edges, then that is a 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel with high probability. And I'm done. I don't need to do anything more than that. Just sample over. Okay? And uh, the cool thing is that this subsampling works for just about every valued CSP that there is, right? So, so you can think of, uh, you, you, you can think of uh, max cut as you have some variables and you have some constraints and you want to set the variables to something and the constraints are either satisfied or not, and you want to satisfy the maximum number of constraints. Yeah? Uh, and that, that's your objective function, and now you, you subsample a linear number of constraints, and that is a 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel with high, uh, with high probability. So let me actually remark that, that neither this result uh, nor the partial vertex cover result is something that we proved. Uh, this is... Uh, like the, the subsampling for uh, the subsampling for max cut or at least the version for, for max sat is uh, folklore. Do you know this? Yeah, I think I think this is folklore. The partial vertex cover approximate kernel is already there in the one plus epsilon approximation algorithm of Marx. He that he computes this kernel and brute forces it. We we just say, hey, these things are actually approximate kernels in our language. Okay, so, 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 it's, so, so for this, uh, I'm giving you some cute examples of lossy kernels so that you'll know how they work, um, but this is not what we are working hard to do in our paper. Uh, that's more technical, so I don't want to talk about So the last thing I'm going to talk about is actually from our, from our lossy kernels paper, and this is uh, for the connected vertex cover problem. So suppose I give you as input uh, a graph G, 
uh, and I ask you, can I find a vertex cover of size uh, that's as small as possible, that it is a vertex cover, and it induces a connected graph. Okay? And now for once, our parameter is going to be uh, the size uh, of the optimum. So, so I don't like using the size of the optimum as the parameter. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I will. Um, but you can come to me later and then I'll rant to you why optimum is a bad parameter. It should be the value of the solution and not the optimum on the instance. That's the right parameter. In particular, you don't know what the optimum of the instance is. Uh, so it's, it's not nice to have a parameter that you don't know. One, one, one thing too. But, but anyway, um, what's known for this problem? Well, it does have a factor two approximation. Uh, and 2 is the right number. Uh, we can't have a 1.99 approximation, assuming unique ends. Um, it is FPT, right? But it doesn't have a polynomial kernel unless dot, dot, dot. Right? So what's a natural target? Well, it's either 1.99 approximation, approximate kernel of polynomial size, or it's a 1 plus epsilon kernel of polynomial size. Uh, we're optimists, so we're going to get the 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel. And now we can get again, these different kinds of kernels, uh, you can either get uh, k to the 1 over epsilon or 2 to the 1 over epsilon poly k or 1 over epsilon squared times poly k. But now you should be awake, right? You can't do this because uh, now your value of the optimum solution is the parameter, it's k. So if I chose epsilon to be like opt over opt minus 1, uh, then if I had a kernel such as on the right, it would actually give me a polynomial kernel for connected vertex cover, and I can't have that. Right? So I can't be too optimistic. Uh, so what we're going to do is get one of these. Right? We're going to get uh, k to the 1 over epsilon size 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel for connected vertex cover. So in particular, what is it we're going to do? If I give you a graph G, uh, then in polynomial time, I'm going to output some induced subgraph of G uh, with the following property. So first, uh, every connected vertex cover that's reasonably small uh, of your graph G prime is actually a feasible solution in your original graph. So, so, so feasible solutions backwards are preserved perfectly, uh, but your subgraph might not quite have as small of a connected vertex cover as your original graph used to be. And this is a funny thing, right? You, you look at the subgraph and your opt went up. Ah, what the hell happened? Well, what happens was that, of course, if you have an obvious vertex cover that's not connected, you could have a single vertex that connects all of it. And so you pick the best vertex cover, you connect it using a single vertex that sees all of them. And now you, you happen to remove that vertex when you made the kernel, and now your opt went up. Right? So you just have to make sure that you don't mess up too much in this way when you're making your kernel. OK, so, so, this is a, so, so here's the construction of G prime. The first thing you're going to do is you run a two approximation, because you know it exists, and you set k. From now on, I'm going to say k is equal to the size of that approximate solution. Okay, so I know that G does have, um, so, so G does have a uh, vertex cover or connected vertex cover of size K, uh, but now you have to remember that, I am, that K is not equal to opt. Opt could be much, much less than K, or at mo it could be as much as, or as low as K over two, right? So even though that I know that there is a vertex, connected vertex cover of size k, I'm, I'm not done yet. So now what do I do? I just do bus kernel for vertex cover. Like the, the normal, the first kernel you ever learned in your life, that's what I'm going to do now, right? Uh, so, so, so you let h be the set of vertices of degree uh, at least k, and you know that any vertex of degree at least k plus 1 has to be in every vertex cover of size at most k. Uh, so therefore, there can be no more than k of them. OK, so great. So, so, so they're over there. Uh, then there is some independence at i with the property that every vertex in i has his neighborhood in h. Okay, you can have many of those. 
but we know that we cannot possibly have more than k square edges uh, with both endpoints outside of H. Because we do have a vertex cover of size at most k, right? And the degree in R is less than k, so if we have more than k square edges here, then uh, we couldn't, th then we had k vertices of degree less than or equal to k that covered more than k square edges, and that couldn't happen. Right? So we have this nice decomposition of our graph. Uh, we have this nice decomposition of our graph into three parts, h, r, and i. And of course, if we were working with normal vertex cover, what we would do is we would pick h into the vertex cover, we would remove it, and then i would be irrelevant and disappear and we would be done. Right? Now, for connected vertex cover, we can't do that. And that, the reason is, is that once we pick h, well, we cover all of the edges incident to h, but we still have to connect them back up because it's, it's a, we're looking for a connected vertex cover, not a vertex cover. Right? Uh, so we can't just remove them. Uh, and in particular, the vertices of i could be really useful to connect these vertices back up. Uh, and, and that's why we can't delete them. Okay, so uh, now we're going to, to do some more stuff, yeah? Uh, and, and make sure that, we, that there's things that we can delete without, uh, without break it, removing vertices that are too important for connecting H back up again. So that's really what's happening. Okay, so what are we going to do? First, let's make sure that we keep the fact that every vertex in H does have degree at least k plus 1. So how do you do that? For every vertex, you just mark k plus 1 vertices that are neighbors of that vertex. You take all of the marked vertices, there's like k times k plus 1 of them, you call them M. Great. Uh, so now, I claim that uh, if I look at any subset of H union R union M, so any vertex that is basically not up here on the right in the I set, um, and I look at any, uh, I look at any uh, vertex cover of size at most K in this graph, then that is also a vertex cover in G. Yeah? And, and this is just a bus kernel, right? Because we're saying, well, such a vertex set has to contain all of H, uh, but then all of the edges incident to I are covered anyway. So that, that's really it. Okay. So now, uh, what, what do we do? Well, if we keep, right, if we keep all of H, all of R, and all of M, then we have already ensured that any connected vertex cover of our reduced instance is a connected vertex cover in the original one, right? So now the only thing we need to do is we need to remove some more vertices that are unmarked so that on one hand I don't have too many vertices left. Right? And on the other hand, I didn't remove so many vertices that the opt of my resulting graph becomes way bigger than, the, than my original opt. I didn't remove any vertices that are too important for connecting things. And I'm getting close to the end, so I'm only going to tell you what I remove, I'm not going to give you the proof for why that is correct. So what we're going to do is the following. We're going to set some parameter d, which is about 100 over epsilon. And what we're going to do is the following. Uh, for every subset x of size at most d, so every subset of h, uh, I ask myself, does there exist some vertex in i uh, so I is up here, that sees those vertices in, uh, in H, and if there is, I mark one. So, so that's, this is my, so, so I look at every subset of the high degree vertices, and I ask, uh, does there exist some subset of I that sees this subset? And if there is, I keep it. Okay, now or I, I mark that vertex, but only one per subset. Now, how many subsets of size at most d are there? Well, k to the d, k to the 1 over epsilon. So I'm going to mark no more than k to the 1 over epsilon vertices in this way. And now, uh, this is, so, so this is my kernel. I'm going to take all of the unmarked vertices, and I'm going to remove them. So, so here, like, so, so uh, this is my original 
R, H, and M, but then I mark additionally K to the D vertices of I, and I remove all of the other vertices of I. And then there is a relatively simple argument. Actually, I will let myself go five minutes over time and take off your coffee time to tell you a very quick sketch of this proof. What is D? What? what is D? D is one over epsilon. So I say that for every, so for every subset of what size one over epsilon of H, okay, I check is there a vertex in I that sees whose neighborhood contains this subset. And if there is, I mark that vertex in I, I say I'm not going to delete him. Okay, that's, the, this is the, so, so for, every, for every small subset, really what's happening is that why am I keeping these vertices in I? Because they can be useful to connect vertices in H, right? So uh, if I look at a small subset in H and I ask, is there some vertex that alone could connect all of these guys? And if there is, then I say, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep him to possibly do that job. That, that, that's really what's happening. And of course, if there's multiple that see the same subset, you only need to keep one, because you don't need more than one person to do the same job, because then you'll do the same job twice. You don't want to do that. Okay, so uh, what happens is uh, you, you, not, you, you, you want to prove that this is actually a kernel, and, and here is a brief sketch of the analysis. And this is, um, suppose I started out with some optimum solution in G, uh, and if that optimum solution doesn't use any of the vertices that I removed, then that's already still an optimal solution, right? So the only thing that I have to make sure is that if it is using vertices that I delete, I can replace it with some vertices that I didn't delete, yeah? Okay. Now, of course, I know that I'm not going to destroy the property of being a vertex cover. I, I'm getting that for free from the bus kernel anyway. So the only thing I need to care about when I do this replacement is keeping my set connected. Okay? So now what do I say is, okay, well, let's look at the spanning tree of the graph induced by S. And then uh, we ask ourselves the following thing. Well, if I'm using some vertex that I'm supposed to be deleting, the V over here, and then I ask, okay, in the spanning tree, is his degree more than D or less than D? Okay? If his degree is more than D, suppose D is equal to 3, then I take the three first neighbors and I replace those three first neighbors by the vertex who I marked when I considered that set. Yeah? So, so it will look li like this. Right? So, so I added one new vertex to my set S prime. Okay? And if his degree is less than D, right? now his degree is 2, then I know that there is some vertex that I did mark that had precisely this set. So now I just replace it. Right? I remove him from the solution and, and replace him. Okay? And then I just do that for every vertex that I deleted. So, so I move D edges of a time over to a vertex that was marked, and then when I'm done moving the edges at a time, I move the vertex, right? And now you ask yourself, well, how many extra vertices did you add to your solution? Well, every time I added a vertex to my solution, I moved the edges of the spanning tree from like a bad vertex to a good vertex. Right? So how many times can you do that? No more than the number of edges in the spanning tree divided by D. Right, and D is 1 over epsilon, so it's at most epsilon k. And that's it. Yeah? So, so connected vertex cover has a 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel of size k to the 1 over epsilon, and obvious open problem, can it be k to the like 0 0.01 over epsilon, or can it be uh, 2 to the power 1 over epsilon times k squared? Okay? So, after the coffee break, Fahad will tell you how to prove lower bounds. Uh, hopefully, you can now get it here. Uh, my, my guess is that the answer is no, but, but prove me wrong. Right? Um, so, uh, to end on a philosophical note, right, uh, it appears that, we, that quite often the optimists win. Right? So, so, quite often you can get lossy kernels that not only beat the best approximation and the best kernel size, uh, they, they beat the best approximation and the best kernel size in the best way that you could hope for. Okay, so thanks.
Any questions? All right, so let's thank the speaker again.